So today I want us to consider not being stuck in traffic, but being stuck in life. You see, because sometimes we find ourselves in situations where your life is not progressing. You're not moving forward. Have you ever found yourself in that position? For those of us who are old school, we remember the hamsters, they had a habit trail, remember? And that habit trail was like a little nice cage for, for for the hamsters, and they were on the wheel. And I mean, the wheel kept on spinning and spinning, so the hamster would spend all this time spinning on the wheel, but it would go nowhere. How many of you feel sometimes that's where your life is? You're not being fulfilled. You're not finding any joy. And whatever you do, you say, you know, I want to get out of this situation. You try to fix it. And I'm a fixer. Most people are fixers. We want to get out and do this. We do A, B, and C, but we wind up in the same exact place. And we say, what are we doing wrong? Now, for the Christian, there's a possibility that we could be stuck spiritually, stuck in the wilderness, And that's what I want to talk to you about. So as a review, what is the wilderness? What is Cap Wilderness? Because we've been in the series this whole month. Wilderness is a period of time when a Christian experiences testing, trials, temptation, spiritual warfare, or persecution through various kinds of problems. See, when we give our lives to the Lord, the Christian knows that, you know, we have this relationship with God and we're walking with God. How many of us love to walk with God? So we're walking with God, but there are times where the Holy Spirit will lead us into the wilderness. And like I said before, this is a painful place. Have you ever been in God and said, God, I'm not doing anything wrong, but why does it feel like, ouch? An ouch moment where things aren't going right, you feel unfulfilled, you're being persecuted, you feel confused, you feel like, God, what's going on? I've asked that question so many times. It's, it is painful, but the good news is that it is only supposed to be temporary. It's not permanent. And so in other words, yes, God will lead us into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit will lead us into the wilderness, but we're not supposed to stay in the wilderness forever. Proof of that is in the life of Jesus. Before Jesus started his ministry, I'm going to give you a quiz. For those of you who know the answer, you know, when I say you get points. Okay, so <laughs> Jesus was in the wilderness for how many days? 40. 40. All right, so ooh, you guys read your Bible. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, so, so for, he spent 40 days in the wilderness. It tells us the Holy Spirit led him, and in those 40 days, or at the end, he was tempted by the devil, right? So many of you just know he was basically for 40 days, and that's when his ministry started. And he went on, began to heal people and touch people, and eventually gave his life on the cross to die and and be resurrected. All right, so now let's go to the Old Testament. Now, the Israelites, the people of God, they were in the wilderness also. Now, how many years did they spend in the wilderness? 40. Wow, there's something with that 40. But uh, now this is uh, extra credit. How much time should they have spent in the, in the journey? Because they spent 40 years, but it wasn't a 40-year journey. It wasn't supposed to be 40 years. How many of you How many of you would say, okay, I know the answer. What is the answer? How long should it have taken this journey to out of Egypt into the promised land? Because that's where they were going. They were going, God has a destination for them, and that destination was the promised land. How long? Ooh. 11 days. I, yes, 11 days right there. Give that woman a Dunkin' Donut card or something. <laughs> Thank you so much. And prove of this, because, you know, we're not making this stuff up. We got to make sure that we, it's, it's biblically accurate, right? So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 2. So it says, normally it takes only 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnum, going by the way of Mount Seir. So here we understand that, hey, man, it was only supposed to take 11 days in the wilderness, but it didn't take 11 days. It took 40 years. How many know that's a discrepancy, right? That's, that's being stuck. You're, you're stuck in the wilderness. In fact, the only two people that actually made it out of the wilderness into the promised land, into their destiny, into their call in life were two men, and that was Caleb and Joshua. That's the only, out of thousands and thousands of people, imagine all of us, a thousand Christians, you get them in a room and only two make it out the wilderness. So you have to consider today, am I prolonging 
my time in the wilderness. Yes, I have to go in the wilderness. God does his work and takes us out. But there are some people, because of the things they are going through in their life or the things they are struggling with or the things they won't release to Jesus that are finding themselves stuck in the wilderness and they have no one to blame but themselves. Now, Paul writes about this to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. He says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. So he's talking about the Israelites, okay? They, they were all baptized in, into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. So they drank for the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock, rock was Christ. This is the important part. I want you to pay close attention to this. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So here we find that, first of all, he says all four times in these verses of Scripture. Why was he emphasizing four? Because he was letting the church know, because remember, he's talking to the church now. He said each and every person had an opportunity to know God and experience God, and they did experience God on their own. So God was blessing the multitude. They met God in the wilderness. God was there in the wilderness. God provided for them. God protected them. And God, in other words, they all had a chance to get out of the wilderness but most of them, except two, were stuck in the wilderness and actually died in the wilderness. What was the issue? What was the issue? It was disobedience and unbelief. So why is Paul telling the church this? Why do we have to know this? Because he wants to, us to understand. Look at verse 5. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So here's the one thing that we have to understand. This is the one thing that we have to understand when this is what, what I'm trying, the message that I'm trying to convey today is that living life as we please will keep us stuck in the wilderness. That's the main thing. That's if you can only take one thing, and I'm going to explain, I'm going to break it down, but the one thing you need to know today is living life as we please will leave us stuck in the wilderness. So Paul was talking to the church and he was saying, hey, it's one thing to say you're a Christian. It's another thing to live it out. And he was warning the church. He, was, he took out the receipts. And he said, look, I'm going to show you the receipts of the Israelites in the wilderness. All of them had an, had an opportunity to experience God's best, to live out their destiny. But most of them did not. And he, he's gonna, we're going to see how he broke it down. He broke it down to let us know. Because a lot of times we find ourselves as Christians in situations where God's not moving, God's not working. We feel trapped. We feel frustrated. And the first thing we want to do is blame God. God, what is your problem? But God is saying it's not a God problem. It is a us problem. It is a you problem. It is a me problem. And that's the issue that many times we have to understand. So our, children, so our attitude in the wilderness will determine and behavior will determine whether we get out or not. So once again, living life as we please will keep us stuck in the wilderness. So Paul begins to break down. He not only because he just mentioned this, he said, hey, uh, these are the reasons. And he points out four reasons why the Israelites remain stuck. Most of them remain stuck in the wilderness. So we're going to we look at this and say, well, maybe that's what I'm dealing with. This is what's keeping me in the wilderness. And the first thing is idolatry, idolatry. So look at verse 7. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as, is, as, it is, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. So here, Paul, because he knew the word of God, he said, you know, I'm going to point out a story. I'm going to take out a receipt. I'm gonna, let's look at Exodus 32. And a lot of you perhaps are familiar with this text. Here we read that Moses went up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. If you saw the Ten Commandments, the, you know, the movie, any of you have ever seen it in your lifetime, you know that Moses went up. Behind me, know when Moses went up, the people acted up. And I'm guilty of that, too, because when mom used to go on a couple days off, and you know what I'm saying, and just break out in the house, you know, that was party time, right, you know? You know see, what, see what I could get away with. So they went up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, and he stayed away for 40 days. This 40 thing, right? 
He stood up for 40 days and the people became worried and they were saying, what's going on? Moses is not coming back. God has abandoned us in the wilderness. And let's look at Exodus 32.1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, who's like the second command, and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. We don't know, but see, the eye shouldn't have been on Moses, the eye should have been on a true one mighty God because God used Moses. Moses wasn't, the, but they call him the deliverer, but how many know the true deliverer was God the Father? And God was there, God was there, but at that, that moment, so when things didn't work out, when God seemed distant, when, when God was nowhere to be found, they said, hey, they went back to the way they thought they should live, and it says, we need to serve, we need to make our own God. So they gathered all the jewelry, they threw all the jewelry in the fire, and out came what? Many of you know, a golden calf. And so look what happened, Exodus 32, 6. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Ooh, they went to church. Afterwards, they sat down to eat, drink, and got up to indulge in reverie. So look, it's like, you know, we go to church in the morning. Woo, hallelujah. You guys are early birds. You, on, you know, give yourselves a hand. You're in church. I'm, I'm serving Jesus. I'm devoted to Jesus. But see, in the afternoon. I'm going to party. I'm going to go out. That's where we is. That means they party. They party hard. And so it's the inconsistency, and that's what will keep us in the wilderness. Many fail to understand that your inconsistency will keep us in the wilderness. He said, well, I don't worship a golden calf, but there are modern idols, and we did a series last year about modern idols that take the place of God. Anything that takes our devotion, anything that removes God from the picture, anything that we say, I need this, I can't live without this, and it's not God, that is an idol in your life. What are such idle relationships? A relationship could be, good relationships could be money, ourselves. How many people could love ourselves? You see people all the time. Don't I, you just hate this? I see this all the time, these selfies. Do you, I, I, I don't get it. I mean, I don't want that many pictures of myself. But that's just, I mean, I mean don't seem that the norm, right? Some of you even now right now, oh, so Jesus, praise the Lord. All right, sorry. Um, but, <laughs> but we can see possessions, entertainment, anything that will keep us from trusting God. This is the truth because a lot of us says God's number one, but that's not the first thing you turn to when things get bad. Hallelujah. What's the first thing you think of in the morning? When it comes to modern idols and idols and, and idolatry, we got to figure out this is the thing that, that we turn to, that we feel that we can't live out without. The first thing I'm thinking about, this is constantly on my mind. That, if it's not God, that's an idol in your life. You could be, but it's my family. I love my family. Yes, God wants you to love your family, but how many know God wants you to love him more than your family? And, and I know some of you have, oh, that's my baby. Don't talk about my baby right now. But God is saying at this moment that your baby cannot take the place of God. I'm sorry, mothers, but mothers and fathers say amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. amen. See, what happens with these idols, they promise fulfillment. They promise, because see, these idols, this golden calf, they could control it. See, because when you serve the one true God, you can't be inconsistent. When you get the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you come to church in the morning, but you're going to know how many know it's not just what you do here. Is what you do afterwards. Like I remember this story about this pastor, right? This pastor was calling people in the church, you know, just to be friendly. How you doing? So he called a sister of the church and he said, hey, how you doing? She said, who this? <laughs> how you blanking the blank out my number? And so he was like, wait a minute, uh, sister so-and-so. This is Pastor. Oh, my God, Pastor, how you doing? I'm sorry, Pastor, Pastor, I'm sorry, but I'm a part-time Christian, and you caught me on my day off. Oh, Lord God. I, I, I. <laughs> it went over here. <laughs> Some of you been caught on your day off. <laughs>
See, because on your day over, you do what you want to do. And that's what the kind of God, that's why when you serve the one true God, that's idolatry. And these idols were causing them to say, you know, we can party, we can live these inc inconsistent lives. We can compartmentalize our, 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 our lives so that one minute we're in church and I'm totally devoted to God in church. But these two hours, ooh, I'm serving Jesus. I love God. But I'm going to be afterwards. You need to walk in spirit and in truth, and that's a consistent walk. And I know it's this habitual thing when you have no problem with it. Because there's some people that just don't, and I remember even my own life, didn't have this, this issue that I had this problem. I remember, and I'm going to keep it real and transparent. When I first gave my life to the Lord, one of my idols, um, when I rededicated my life, was drinking. So drinking was a part of, so every time I had an issue, a problem, I would turn to alcohol. I love Jesus, and this was my excuse. I just want to escape. I know the devil and Jesus and problems, but sometimes I don't want to deal with that. I, don't, I got no time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that, right? So I would turn to alcohol. And that alcohol would somehow appease me, but it wouldn't solve my problems, but that was my idol. And so I was in church saying, oh, Jesus, I love you, but when things got rough, when things weren't going my way, when I had conflict in the church, because I started working in the church and all this stuff. And even when I first started the ministry, my own church, uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm telling you, keep it real, keep it 100. That, that look, that was like, and that was my excuse. That's my time. That's my time. I'm going to do it. And you know what your own vice is. That's your modern idol. You know what you turn to. You could turn to gossip. You could turn to pornography. You could turn to anything, anything good or bad. You could turn to food. These are the things that I turned to, but I had to learn. And God had to say, you can't live your life this way. You have to be consistent. That is an idol, and I had to surrender that. And so it was a lot, it's a lot easier just to go to something that has, you know, there's a modern idol and, and, and drink and, and, and not even think about it. Because it's not going to control, I mean, it controls you, but, it, but it's not going to really dictate your life. In other words, but it's true, true God. I said, God said, come to me. All you are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. And, and Jesus needed to do the healing. But to, in order for him to do the healing, I had to expose my heart. And that was the hard part because I see the alcohol don't ask no questions. But Jesus will ask questions. Jesus will go deep. And so that's what happens. So that's what we see and that we understand that not allowing God to purge us in the, idol, the idols in our life will keep us stuck in the wilderness. So once again, living life as we please will why? Will keep us stuck in in the wilderness. So let's look at the second thing. Remember, I said there were four. Second thing is immorality. I know we don't have this problem in church, so we're going to move on. No. <laughs> All right. So, what, so look, look what he says, um, verse 8. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them died, did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. So once again, he takes out the receipts. Yo, let's look at Numbers, the book of Numbers 25. And here we find that it tells us that the Israelites were going, began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women. See, there were the Canaanite women. God said, don't mess with those ladies. But the freaks came out at night. <laughs> <laughs> and the guys are like, oh. And, and they got messy. And how I many of sometimes people do things in the dark? And the Bible says, the verse I always kept me in check as a Christian, the Bible says the deeds done in darkness will be exposed in the light. Yes. So right now you're in church, you're a saint, you're good, but one day you're messing around, you up here, you're in church, you give your greed and everything, nobody know my business, but one day that person's going to walk in, you go to church, oh, Lord. It'll come out. I'm telling you, how many know can testify? It'll come out. So I said, Lord God, keep me, keep me. So what was happening was that God became very angry. He says, you can't be doing this because, you know, he had a, they had a coming relationship with them. And so he says, you know what? We're going to kill the people who have slept. There was no chance for them. They were gonna, we were going to kill. We were going to kill all the people, who, all the men that were sleeping with these women. So here Moses had to deliver the verdict. But this is what happens. This is the craziness. Numbers 25, 6. Remember, I told you it was Numbers 25. Then an Israelite man brought into a camp, brought into the camp a Midian woman right before the eyes of Moses. And the whole assembly of Israel were there sleep, weeping as the, the whole assembly of Israel were there weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So you have, to, you have to read this interesting story because it gets like little blood. It's a very good story. So in other words, we're having church. <laughs> Hallelujah. This dude was brazen enough, yo, I'm bringing my girl, yo. 
and he went into a tent. Remember, they were outside, you know, they were wanderers. So and he didn't care. He, he, like, he, he, he wasn't thinking. These people were weeping. They were seeking God. They, were, they knew they were going to die. Families were crying. So he had the audacity, and this is what happens. A lot of times people just continue to think that it's okay. As long as I serve God, I can do whatever I want in the bedroom. What I do in the bedroom is my business. No, it's not as a child of God. How I many you know God needs to be, if he's Lord of all, he necessarily, he necessarily needs to be Lord of the bedroom. Amen. Amen. And God has a standard. And the culture says, hey, everything goes. It's craziness. You watch TikTok videos. You know, I'm just a craziness that's going on in the world. Social media, everything they're promoting, you see all these things, and, and, and I'm down with whatever. You got to be down. Yeah, you do you, you got to do me, whatever. But that's not the word of God. God is a holy God, and God says, I made a covenant between a man and a woman in marriage, marriage only. And that's what people got to understand. Look what it says. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual, immoral, nor the idolater, nor the adulterer, nor the man who had sex with men or thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunken, nor the slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I know when I read this verse, some, of pe some people get offended. They get offended. Oh, we hate people. It's not the hate. That's the word of God. Amen. And God's standard does not change. If you're going to serve God, you have to believe, one, that God's ways are best. Yeah. God, you know, and, and you have to believe what is, is truth is truth. He is absolute truth. You can't say my truth is, is above God's truth. And so he, he is absolute truth. And whatever he says is not going to be that way. This is the way you have to confine the marriage. And it's not. And he created sex, praise the Lord. So he created sex, but he created it in confines. So sex not evil itself. But it's confined in the marriage covenant, only only a marriage covenant. Anything outside that covenant, it is sexual immorality. And so what happens is the brazen, because people come into church, and I tell you, they want to serve, they want to sing, they want to do all this stuff. And they're, they're in church, they're fine, but outside, they're freaks. Not a y'all, that's a second service. <laughs> Just joking. But you got to understand that this is, there has to be a consistency. You can't be sleeping with everybody going around. Well, nobody knows. It's my business. I'm grown. And that's what people do all the time. And you can't play the role. And you can't say, as long as I serve God in these areas, that other area is off limits to God. It can't be off limits to God. And, it's, and that will keep you stuck in the wilderness because you're going to wind up, first of all, in a bunch of bad relationships. Things aren't going to work out. You're going to have, like, the curse of God over you. Things, and people don't want to hear that. Sometimes in church, look, I don't want to hear, and they get upset and be like, and sometimes even when I'm preaching, oh, people are going to feel offended. People are going to be like, oh, this church is about hate. No, God is love. God gives everybody a chance. But you got to, but you got to, God is not going to compromise. Amen. If you don't surrender the area, that area of sexual immorality, or sexual, your sexuality to God, you will be stuck in the wilderness. Living life as we please will keep us in the wilderness. Now, the third thing and the fourth thing, we'll have combined them because of time. It says testing and grumbling. Let's look at verse 9 and 10 of, first, of, of Corinthians again. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. I do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by destroying angels. Hmm, go show that wilderness. And God don't play in the wilderness, right? He's been killing them with snakes and killing them with destroying angels. What was he mentioning? All right, first he mentions a story that happened, and write, hopefully you're writing this down, in Numbers 21. And look what he says in Numbers 21, 5. They, said, they spoke against God, against Moses, and said, why you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. There was a pattern with the Israelites in the wilderness. They complained a lot. Now, when it comes to complaining, it's very important. This is what we have to understand. It's okay to complain to God, but not about God. I'm going to say that again. It's okay to complain to God because we see it in the Psalms. Sometimes, God, I hate my situation. I hate what, you know, when I, I don't like this, I don't like that. That's okay. To, but when you start talking about God, that's when it becomes a problem. We start complaining when you start, God's not good. He's not faithful. I remember my, when I gave my life to the Lord, when God didn't answer my prayers the way that I wanted. Oh, God, you ain't right. I guess you don't really love me. Or oh, we just sing these songs about you, my deliverer. You just, yeah, right. That's not what it is. 
And so what happens is, and we have to find ourselves, what kind of relationship do you have with God the Father? Is he God only when he does everything your way? Now I'm going to tell you the truth. Every one of us has had a prayer that we prayed to God and he did not answer it the way. How many could just by show hands online, online, if you said yes. So in other words, you know, you pray for that loved one to get well and then he died. You pray for your marriage to be healed and you got divorced. You pray for your children and they wind up incarcerated or in a bad situation. We pray these prayers and does that negate the faithfulness of God? Is God good only when he answers your prayers and he does things? Or is it God good all the time, even when it doesn't make sense? Even when, and so what happens is complaining, because this is what happened, because, you know, God provided, gave them bread and gave them man and gave them water. But the next time, when they were in want, instead of saying, yo, God provided for us before, he will do it again. That's what we should have done. They started complaining. And many of us begin to com- are complaining now, but we forget about the goodness of God and that he's been faithful to us in the past, the things he's taken us out of, the situations where he delivered us, where he showed himself to be God. You're forgetting those times, and now you're just thinking about the here and now, because right now I got my feelings <laughs> twisted. And in my, I'm all up, caught up in my feelings. How I many know feelings will lead us the wrong way? And so we see it right there. So the next one is found in Numbers 16, verse 3. So they came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron, saying, you've gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why do you see yourself above the Lord's assembly? So you see, it's not enough just complain about God, but when you complain about the leadership, when you complain, and, and I know some pastors yeah. use this and you can't say nothing, but in all reality, we find a spirit that I've seen. I've been doing this for quite some time. I've been doing it for 20 something years. I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lack of submission to the leadership in the church. Absolutely. And what I mean by that, you can come to Harvest Field, but you're not submitting to any leader. Or you say, I'm only going to submit to the pastor, but all the other pastors need to take a seat back. Or even I'm in the ministry and, other, and I tell you, you're the head usher, tells you to do it this way, you're going to, I'm doing it this way. That's not submitting. Amen. And when you begin to grumble, because they were saying to Moses and Aaron, because they wanted to see the, that these other people, God says, this tribe, the Levi tribe is going to be, they're going to be priests. They're only going to be priests. It's only going to be them. And they were saying, well, we're going to be priests too. See, everybody wants to be in ministry now. Everybody wants their own YouTube channel. Everybody wants their social media. Everybody thinks that, you know what I'm saying, they read a couple Bible scriptures that they, they, they're at the qualification to be, you know, they're at a position to teach. But the Bible tells us in the book of James, be careful, teachers. Those of you who exalt yourself to teachers because you will be severely judged more than any other person. So in other words, what I'm saying, because there's going to come to the time where we have to submit and look, at, I'm, I'm the first one to say no church is perfect, no pastor is perfect, but still there has to be something inside of you that says, I believe the har- God sent me to Harvest Field Community Church. I believe in the ministry. If you don't believe in the Harvest Ministry, you don't believe, then maybe this is not the place for you. Because I see a lot of people come and it says, my old church, we did this way. My old church, we did this way. My old church, but why you left your old church then? <laughs> if it was so good, why are you here? I don't get it, right? And they want to confine, you know, what I mean? and some suggest, and believe me, and I take suggestions and I move, but we have to be consistent with the vision of this church. And, you know, it's Harvest Field Community Church. I mean, people have told me, take the community out, be international, be all this stuff. Look, my heart is for the Bronx, and I don't have to apologize for being in the Bronx and feeling for the Bronx. We, we got th- thousands of people in the Bronx here of all different cultures. This is international, you know, and, and I believe, and <laughs> just walk down the block, you know, go, and you see how international it is. We got Ms. Inez, we got Dunkin' Donuts, we got the Korean fish market, right? Just right there. Yeah. And Kali and across the street. Praise the Lord. That's around us right there. Yes. And that's what we understand. People come in. If you can't submit, this is not. If you, and this is what I tell people, that's when people say, look, I want to leave. I'd rather tell, tell them to leave because you tell a, a person to stay, they're going to be unhappy and they're going to cause problems to you. Yeah. And you have to understand, you got to be, I, am I a grumbler? And people can see people don't think grumbling and complaining is, 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 first of all, you're not, that's not a ministry and that's not your calling. 
And there's a difference, because people, I don't mind you giving, be, there's a difference between complaining and having concerns. Concerns, you come up with solutions. Because anybody can say, oh, this, 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 this. I see people all the time. Okay, they, they come into my office. Blah, 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 blah. You need to, blah, 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 blah. And they walk away. Oh, I feel so much better. I said, but what about the solutions? Let's work on solutions. Oh, that's not, that's not what I'm called. God just gave me this vision. And so usually when God shows you a problem in a church, that means he wants you to fix it. You may see a problem in the children's ministry, you said, but God is putting that in your heart. When at my last church, how I started ministry with the youth, I saw that there was a hole there. They weren't really working with the youth, especially the youth from the streets. So I stepped up. I could have easily complained, oh, this church is... Because they ain't doing this, they ain't doing that. No, they don't care about the youth. They don't care about the young people. But no, instead of just talking about it, you be about it. How many can say amen to the Lord? Amen. amen. So see, complaining characterized. And so God responded in such a way. And we see that complaining is not a calling. Grumbling and complaining or lack of submission to your leaders. Believe me, and I know our leaders aren't perfect, but you got to love them with the grace of God and the mercy of God. Continue to pray for me. Continue to pray for my wife. Continue to pray to the leadership of the church. All your leaders, they're not perfect. You bring it up to them. You wake it up. But if you're sitting there complaining, if you're going out to the diner and all you do is bad mouth in the service and, and saying this is wrong, this is wrong. I believe me, I think Christians, I know how we are, right? So we all, oh, did you see? It's a loaded question. What do you think about the service? You know you're starting some, some mess, right? What do you think about the worship songs we sang this what do you think about that? People always say this, oh, the anointing. Somebody, oh, the anointing. There's no anointing. There's no anointing. I said, when you worry about your anointing, you worry about, you look, you, you worry about your own life. As if your life is all that stuff. You all jacked up. <laughs> You're the last person I want to listen to right now. I'm keeping it real. I'm not going to go, I go to get my hair cut and his hair is all like this. Ah I'm waiting for the next barber. I ain't going to you, Amen. So lastly, living life as we please, we'll be stuck in the wilderness. So Paul said, he took out the receipts, he talked about their past, he's saying, hey, this is the reality of life. This is what's going to keep you stuck in the wilderness. See, all of us, oh, we want our destiny, promised land. You know what I'm saying? We're moving forward. We sing that song in church. You know, we used to sing, move forward, move forward, but not everyone's going to move forward. Some of us are going to be stuck in this perpetual cycle for years and years and years. And you, like the Israelites, might die in the wilderness. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to die in the wilderness. How many, I want, how many of you says, I want to experience all God has for me? But it goes down to if you live life on your own terms or live as we please, in other words, you will be stuck in the wilderness. You have to ask yourself as I close, how are you living? Are you truly submitted every area to God? Are you saying, God, this is the way? Because he brought some, he talked about four things. He talked about, well, his idols. Are there modern, modern idols in your life? He talked about immorality. Let's be real. Some of you may be having some issues right now. Living together, shacking up, doing your thing. Oh, I got to change that too? And love, I, can I just love Jesus? No. <laughs> Amen. God wrote the book. Grumbling, complaining, not submitting. If that's you, that will keep you stuck. Paul proved it. And I pray, my prayer is that none of us get stuck, that we live out our destiny in God and fulfill him. We say, God, whatever you want, I want to get out of camp wilderness. I don't want to prolong it. If it's only 14 days, I don't want to make it 40 years. And if you agree with me, please join me as I pray. Let's